right, so I did my presentation on what creates speed. I went to the NFL.com archives and found the 2014 combine results for the 40s of the wide receivers and cornerbacks. And uh, I wanted to figure out what created speed. So, get in here. Yeah, thank you. If you hit play on that video, this is Chris Johnson, 2008, running the 40, and a 424, which is the fastest time recorded. Pretty quick. Get another angle. All right, so um, my hypothesis was the lighter the player, the faster the player. Chris Johnson is not a heavy guy, so that's what I was thinking. Um, so I used Galileo's constant of inertia. So if I come over here quick, an object with more mass will cross ball at 145 grams versus an object with a golf ball at 46 grams. The cross ball at 145 will take more force to make it to accelerate. Versus the golf ball, it'll take less. So that's what I based it on. And next slide, please. Um, so the player velocity, I had to convert the yards into meters. Um, took the velocity meters per second. Obviously, just they're about thirty-seven meters per second time, divided by their forty-yard dash time would be like a velocity. Um, if you look at their velocity, it shows a symmetrical shape. Um, you can see right here, here's the peak. Comes down nice. Other side symmetrical with it. Uh, next slide, please. And it shows a pretty, pretty small spread without any outliers. Spread is, spread is right here. It shows a pretty small spread with a, only a range of 0.78 meters per second. Although it is small numbers, it's still pretty small. Pretty small variable there. Um, mean and median are very close. Indicates a pretty tight center. You go on. Um, and then the weight here. So it's very slightly right skewed. That could be argued as symmetrical too. Um, next slide, please. Uh, outliers for the weight. There were three outliers for the weight, which I'll get to a little bit in a little bit. Um, in the center. Center was pretty close there with the mean and the median. And um, the range was 77 pounds. That's almost 80 pounds. It's almost half of me. So that's a pretty wide spread. And there's no notable association between player weight and the velocity in the 40 yard dash. I know some of you might be thinking you see this line here, but when you actually go through it and do the residual and you, and you calculate a trend line on it, it actually is more like this. And it's not really anything. The R squared value is. 0.04, I believe, so it wasn't anything significant enough to mean anything. Um, get your density. Does it have anything to do with speed? So, density is mass times your volume in centimeters. Volume is just the player's height. You couldn't really find the volume for the players because that would be very difficult. You'd have to do a lot of measurements, which is just not in budget. Um, slightly right skewed. Again, uh, next slide, please. Um, it shows a fairly large split with three outliers. So the high fence is six foot four. The low fence is negative five point eight. So you can't have a negative height. Um, mean and median are pretty close, indicating a tight center. Um, down in here, the range is ten inches. That's from about like knee to gill. Just to give you a little heads up there. So that's a pretty large spread. Um, so, you go to the density, the symmetrical shape. I think you went backwards there. Yeah. Next um, one, please. That's right. Alright, so, the outliers. The outliers <coughs> are pretty much the same for everyone except for the um, player density. That was a little different for Kevin Benjamin, but these players are very, very big guys. So, the outliers are typically taken out of the data. But I'm measuring the outliers. I'm measuring the biggest, strongest, fastest athletes out there. So I wanted to keep them in. I thought it would be inappropriate to take them out because they're a big part of the data. And only 80 guys got to have the big guys in there. And there was no correlation between the measurables. So there was no correlation between 
Density and velocity, there's no correlation between height and weight and velocity. Next slide, please. So that got me thinking, speed is not a height or weight issue. It's more of an issue with technique and stride length and running form. So your first step would be using Newton's first law, obviously. When you take your first step, you're not in motion before you take your first step. Then you need to push off to get yourself in motion. And then those steps have to be Newton's third law. When you're moving, the harder you push the ground beneath you, the farther you go. Equal and opposite reaction force on your foot, pushing you forward. And these are both coachable things, so I thought maybe you could see the conferences and see even better coaches for the higher conferences would get players faster. So next slide, please. So my second hypothesis right here, what I just said. Um, I only did the players from Division One FBS conferences, so that took away 10 players. Um, I had a few Division Two guys in there. I had a few FCS Division One which is not FBS, and I actually had one basketball player from the University of South Carolina on trial for the NFL. So, if you look here, SEC dominates the 2014 combine. There's the SEC in yellow there at 24.29%. And um, here's the thing here, the Tier 2 is not better than Tier 1. I evaluated this. As you look here, Tier 2 has 33 players, as Tier 1 has 24 players. So, the percent of the total would be a little messed up, considering that. So that's why it looks like Tier 2 has more players. But if you look at it this way, the number of conferences per the tiers, so Tier 1 is SEC and Pac-12. Tier 2 is Big Ten, Big Ten, Big 12, and the, um, and the um, ACC. So, you get the 2 and the 3. You got to take the number of players and divide them by the number of conferences. So, you get about an average number of players per conference here. So, as you can see by this bar graph, Tier 1 has the most players per conference in the college football tiers. And if you look here again, bar graph data for percent of subdivision, per, sorry, percent of sub 4 6 cornerbacks, wide receivers, so 4 6 to probably a pretty fast 40, looking at it, um, per college football conference tier. So you get the tiers over there, you got the players, number of players per tier, you have the players under a 4 6. So then you get your percentage of players under a 4 6. So as you look here, you see, you get the same thing as about in the last in a few slides ago, where the tier two is bigger than tier one, simply because there are more players, so it makes bigger, bigger um, percentage, with the uh, sub four six being larger. So if you look at it this way now, you got to go and divide that out by by the two or the three, whichever one respectively is for it, and you'd see that. You would get a pretty, with, that, with the exception of the spike, you get a pretty, you get a pretty, um, what you'd expect to see. So, if you go to the next one for me, please. Um, the reason why there's a spike in Tier 3 is because 5 out of 7 in Tier 3 ran a sub 4 or 6, and there were no players from the ACE, AAC, the um, American Athletic Conference, so it was only the Mountain West. So these are guys from... Fresno State, Wyoming, and Utah State. So these guys aren't exactly coming out of the greatest colleges looking to go for the NFL. So they often get overlooked, and they got to shine and make it. So they get overlooked, and oh, can you go back? Please, please. It's okay. Um, they get overlooked, and they have to run fast. So you notice. So nonetheless, one is trying to get it faster. They should go see one of the lead speed coaches. My bibliography. This data here was for the was for the uh, conference of tiers, tiers conference. I'm sorry. And um, this data here was for the um, player statistics for their 40s and their height and weight in their colleges.